So today I want to look at, just make a little bit more explicit Davidson's conception of a truth theory. Um, the way you a truth theory is Davidson's picture of the way you characterize the meanings of all the sentences of a language. And in his account, the way you do it is by giving a truth definition for um, the language. And I'll just try and give a sense of how he thinks that works. Then I'll look again at the thing we were covering last time, Davidson's instrumentalism, instrumentalism about reference. And I said last time that has something to do with the idea that sentences are primary, that language really has to do with the use of, uh, the use of words is really dependent on their use in sentences. The thing is there is also a sense in which words are primary, and I'll come to that at the end. Okay, so the idea of a truth theory. Um, so just to explain what it is, um, first of all, we need the notion of a meta-language. Um, so, <laughs> that's great. Okay. Um, that, <laughs> it's inspiring. It's uplifting. <laughs> that's good. <laughs> um, uh, so, so far, um, we've been talking about the meanings of English words. Um, I mean, so it, we, we, it's just arbitrary that we chose English. I mean, it's not entirely arbitrary because it's some, practically the only language that we're all pretty sure we understand. I mean, that uh, everyone else understands here. Um, but, um, uh, you know, in principle, we could have been doing the same for French or German or Russian or Chinese or whatever. Um, uh, could have, we could have been discussing um, the meaning of the signs of any particular language. So we can make a distinction between the language we're studying, the language, the meanings of whose signs we're trying to characterize, and on the other hand, the language in which we're talking about that language. So there's a target language, the language we're studying, and the language that we're using to discuss it. Yeah? So um, uh, the object language is the language we're studying, French or German or English or whatever it is. And the meta language is the language in which we talk about our object, our target language. Yeah. So meta comes from um, the Greek word meta, meaning um, the language you use to talk about the language you're studying. Isn't that right? <laughs> um, OK, now suppose you, you take notions like reference or truth. Terms like reference or truth apply to the signs of your object language. Right? So take the language you're studying, French or German or Russian or whatever. The sentences of that language can be true or false. True is a word of English that you use to describe those strings of French or German or Italian or English or whatever it is. Right? So true is a term of the meta language. It's a term used to classify sentences of your object language. Some of those sentences are true, some of them are false. Is that OK? Yep. So true is not an English word? Well, um, in a sense, no. Um, that what's a little bit confusing about the way we've done it so far is that the um, the language that we're studying is English, and we're doing this in English, right? Um, but once you make this distinction between using English as the object language and using it as the meta language, yeah, it becomes clear that true is figuring as a word of the meta language rather than as a word of the object language just because it's a term used to classify words of the object language. Yeah? Okay. Oh, I mean, strings of signs of the object language. Yeah, that, that okay? Okay. So when you're giving a definition of truth for a language, um, you're going to be using the meta language to define true for your object language. Okay? Um, so the meta language um, 
is going to be very rich. It's going to be at least as rich a language as your object language. Um, the meta language, if you're going to study French, the meanings of um, French signs in English, the English has to have a system of signs that is at least as rich as all the signs of French. So your meta language is going to be, contain at least this. There will be a translation in your meta language um, of every sentence of the object language. Or if in English you're talking about signs of English, then um, the English that's your meta language has to have all the signs of your object language and the words true and false and so on as well. All right, so far? OK. Um, so you're going to have in your meta language a translation or a copy of every sentence of your object language. It's also going to have a name for every sentence of your object language. You, you want to be able to talk about your object language, right? So you, need, you want to be able to designate every sentence in it. Come, come down. Come down. Um, you see what I mean? This is just working through what you need in a language that you're going to use to study another language. You need to be able to identify all the signs of your object language. Or you'll need some logical vocabulary, if then, and so on. OK? OK. Um, so consider snow is white. That's a sentence of English. We want to study the meaning of a sentence like snow is white. We want to be able to say something about the meanings of sentences like snow is white. Um, so you give it a name, right? You can give it a name in lots of different ways. You could call it Max. You could call it Ernest. Um, you could call it practically anything, right? Um, but there is um, a standard way of forming names of sentences, which is to put quotation marks around them. So this whole sign here with quotation marks around it, is that a sign of the object language or a sign of the meta language? Very good. Who, who said that? Yeah, right. Uh, it's, you use this. Snow is white is a sign of your object language, sign you're studying. This is how you designate it in your meta language. Yeah? And then you can go on and say this is true or this is false or whatever. Yeah? Make remarks about its meaning. So the meta language is going to have a name and a translation of every sentence in your object language. <laughs> Yeah. We're about to define truth. So um, follow me very closely here. OK. Once you've got a name, and a, trans a name for every sentence in your object language, and a translation of every sentence in your object language, then um, you can give the following formulation. We're going to use S. When I, when I write S in what follows, what's going to replace S will be the name of a sentence in the object language. OK? All right, so um, what would be an example, a sample uh, uh, stand-in for S, replacement of S? It'll be a name for a sentence in your object language, such as Max. Or, <laughs> or Ernest, thank you. <laughs> or Snow is White in quotation marks. Is that OK? These are all names of sentences in your object language. So these will be sample translations of S. And when I write P, what replaces P is the translation or the copy of the sentence you just named in the meta language. Okay. So what will replace P 
if, if S was this, in quotation marks, snow is white, what would um, replace P? Yeah? Very good, exactly. Snow is white without quotation marks. Or if your meta language was French, what would replace P? Would it be just the sentence, la neige est blanche, or something like that? Yeah, yeah? Okay. Um, is that okay for S and P? We are just a step away from defining truth. Um, okay. So in the meta language, we can frame the following sentence. S is true if and only if P for each suitable replacement of S and P. And that's going to be right. So, uh, class, would anyone care to give an, uh, an example? Replacements for S and P? <coughs> Could, could you say that louder? Snow is white. Uh, do you mean in quotation marks? Yeah. Is true if and only if snow is white. Very good. Okay, excellent. Right. Okay. Okay, that all right? You could equally have said max is true if and only if snow is white, but it's kind of clear what's going on if you do it in quotation marks. Right. What about grass is green? How does it go for grass is green? Okay, suppose we name it using quotation marks, yeah? Very good, so you get gra the sentence grass is green is true if and only if grass is green. Getting the hang of this? Um, okay, so, uh, for every sentence now of your object language, every sentence of the language you've studied, this is telling you what it takes for that sentence to be true. Yeah? I mean, give me a hard sentence. Now give me a challenge, <laughs> and I'll define truth. For, I'll explain what it takes for true to apply to it. Frogs smile. Okay, there you go. There's a hard sentence. Well, frog smile is true if and only if frogs smile. Right? Okay. So that works for every single sentence. That's a definition of truth. Um, you now know, you know, if you didn't know what true meant before, you now do. If you took the sentences of French and said, I don't know what it takes for any of them to be true, and you gave this definition, that's it. You've done it. You've defined truth for those sentences of French. OK? That was easy. OK. So a truth theory, the thing about this way of doing it is that there are going to be infinitely many sentences in your language, typically, because sentences can be arbitrarily long, right? Um, so th this is really standing in for an infinite list of SP pairings. So a truth theory um, is going to be when you have a finite set, just a short list of axioms from which you can derive these SP pairings for every um, sentence of your object language. Okay. All right. I just uh, there's no more to this than meets the eye. I'm just telling you what that is, right? So, for example, suppose we have a language with two names and two predicates. <laughs> Curiously appropriate. <laughs> a language with two names and two predicates. Raleigh, Isaac. <laughs> Smokes and fishes. <laughs> How does that go? 
Well, here's your finite list of axioms, right? Raleigh refers to Raleigh. Isaac refers to Isaac. Smokes applies to something if and only if it smokes. Fishes applies to X if and only if X fishes. And then you've got the general rule. A sentence of the form A is F is true if and only if the predicate is F applies to what A refers to. Okay? So suppose you want to know whether Raleigh fishes is true. What does Raleigh stand for? Raleigh. So Raleigh refers to Raleigh, OK? What is fishes? What does it take for fishes to apply to something? Well, x has to fish. So once we toil through the definition, we see that the sentence Raleigh fishes is true if and only if uh, fishes applies to what Raleigh refers to. What Raleigh refers to is Raleigh, and um, fishes applies to Raleigh uh, just in case Raleigh fishes. So the sentence Raleigh fishes is true if and only if Raleigh fishes. Right? So we just did it. We toiled through. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> A pleasure, <laughs> yes. <laughs> OK, so we want to know, we've, we've got these axioms, right? And we're going to figure out what does it take for Raleigh fishes to be true? Well, this tells you Raleigh fishes is true if and only if the predicate fishes applies to what Raleigh, the name Raleigh refers to. Okay. Well, what does the name Raleigh refer to? Well, the name Raleigh refers to Raleigh. Okay. So this sentence is true if and only if fishes applies to Raleigh. Yep. What does it take for fishes to apply to Raleigh? Well, this is telling you Raleigh must fish. Yep. So that's to say, uh, is, if and only if is F applies to what A refers to, what A refers to is Raleigh, and fishes applies to that Raleigh, just in case Raleigh fishes. So what we figured out here is that the sentence Raleigh fishes is true if and only if Raleigh fishes. OK? So th this is, these axioms are about the words. They're not about sentences. Yep. Yeah. But we figured out what it takes for the whole sentence to be true um, from those axioms. Right? So um, you do this for, we, 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 did, we did this for our simple language with um, two names and two predicates. And now your task is just do that for the whole of English. For every sign of English, say something about it, like Raleigh refers to Raleigh, um, such that uh, if, once you say that about it and plug it into this theory, then you can crank out statements of what it takes for any sentence containing that sign to be true or false. Yeah? I mean, this is simple enough, right? If, if I've explained this correctly, this should seem very simple. It is very simple. I mean, <laughs> it's not that I'm explaining it so brilliantly. It actually is very simple. Yeah? Yeah? Um, the thing is, it's not trivial to go even a very simple step beyond this. Consider the sentence, everyone fishes. Suppose you expanded that little language, so now we've got a new sign, everyone. What would the axiom for everyone look like? This is a real question. I'm asking you, what, how do you get, what we want to get is everyone fishes is true if and only if everyone fishes. Right? That's the right SP pairing. Yeah? <coughs> so we want an axiom. We've got an axiom for fishes. We know what the axiom for fishes is. What would the axiom for everyone look like? Yep. Very good. Yeah, yeah. So Raleigh fishes, R Raleigh and Isaac, uh, something like that. Yeah, that's very good. Um, so uh, um, you'd have um, everyone fishes. Is it, everyone is F, if and only if Raleigh is F and Isaac is F. And so on for everybody else. And so on for everybody else. Yeah, um, th that's the tricky part. Y you can do it for. Uh, I, I, I can see you can do it for Raleigh and Isaac. Right, um, and so on for everyone else. 
Um, actually, that's pretty good. Yeah, and so on for everyone else. The thing is, it's not really finite, that, that is it? Because um, uh, you've got, um, if Raleigh fishes, if Raleigh fishes, if um, Isaac does it, um, and then you've got infinitely many, right? Uh, more of these, yeah, th th that's what you mean, and so on. Yeah, so that's pretty good, but it's not finite. Yeah, I mean, I see why you say it, but it's not really finite yet. But it's close. Yeah. So what you've got to do is get something finite for everyone. Yeah. Yep. For all x. For all x what? For all x. <laughs> that, that, that will get you the right answer, <laughs> right? Um, um, yeah, the thing is, I mean, what, what is so good about the first answer is the axiom for fishes is that fishes applies to a particular object if and only if that thing fishes, right? Uh, and the first, the first suggestion really catches that, right? So everyone is hooking up to the axiom for fishes, right? That was the thing about working through all the names. Yeah. The thing about your your account is that we don't know how it's going to how the axiom for fishes is going to hook up to the everyone, because this explains fishes for individual objects. Do you see what I mean? It tells you for each individual object what it takes for the predicate fishes to apply to it. Yeah. And you you now say. Just stick in everyone there, right? But the, everyone's not the name of a particular person. You explain a predicate. Sorry? We're talking in the middle. Right? That's right. Yeah, but you haven't defined. The, 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 this isn't the meta language, right? And you, uh, this is only terms for particular people. Yeah. It doesn't make sense to put in an everyone there. You, you, you see what I mean? Because it's only defined for particular people. That was what was so good about the first suggestion. Yeah? Because it is saying if Raleigh fishes and Isaac fishes and so on. Yeah? Um, but you'd have to change the axiom for fishes to get the effect you want. Um, the thing is, if you remember when we were talking about Russell, the whole point there was that predicates apply in the first instance to individual objects. And then these how many terms like everyone, um, are understood later and dependently on that. Yep. Yeah, uh, it, it, it does, but it's, it's an ingenious suggestion. But that any doesn't apply to any particular x, right? We need to know what that means. I mean, because we haven't yet understood how an axiom that applies only, that, apl uh, that tells you only about the application of the predicate to individual objects um, can be used to uh, um, explain how that predicate works in the context of something like not any particular. You see what I mean? Because that's not the name of an object. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yep. Yeah, good question. Uh, uh, that, I'm, that's actually what I'm going to come to at the end, right? Why, why does it have to be finite? Um, but the, um, the natural answer is, uh, look, we all, when I, when I worked through this and I said, um, you get S is true if and only if P, right? For every sentence of English, um, all of us can recognize that's going to be correct. And for all the infinitely many sentences of English, we know what has to be the case for that sentence to be true. Yeah? Um, uh, th that's just what understanding in English is. There's no bound in the number of sentences you can understand. Um, but uh, we're finite creatures. Presumably, we're doing this on the basis of some finite stock of knowledge. Yeah? So you could say, well, um, how come we, you could say, well, we un we'll understand the whole language if um, w you know what it is for any arbitrary sentence of that language to be true. But you must be able to do that on a finite basis. 
characterize that finite basis, and you'll have described what an ordinary person's understanding of the language is. What, deriving it from something? I'm going to come back to this. So raise this again in just 10 minutes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, okay, so look, you, you see that the, the project here, uh, I mean, you can see that with a, I, with a bit of ingenuity, you guys could solve this. I'm not, I'm not going to pause until we get this cracked. But you could solve this for everyone, right? It's not going to be trivial, but it is solvable for everyone. Um, uh, and then you do it for at least one, many. Then you do it for other bits of the language. You just build up an, a, a, an axiom system for the whole of English from which you can derive every, um, uh, every SP pairing like that. One view of that is, you could say, look, now I'm explaining to you what the meaning is of truth for this language. Another way of thinking of it, Davidson's way of thinking of it, is to say, um, what I'm doing here is I'm characterizing the meaning of every sentence of the object language. And suppose you don't know any French. You, 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 you just have no clue what any French signs mean. And then you're given a theory like this. You're told... Well, um, um, uh, a blanche applies to something just in case it's white, um, for example. Right? You get all these um, uh, uh, predicates of French given characterizations. Um, where's it going? Given characterizations like this. You get all the names of French given char characterizations like that, and then you can derive from them statements for every um, uh, sentence of French what it takes for that sentence to be true. Then you'd understand them all. Le chat est sur le tapis. If you, once you know that that's true, if and only if the cat is on the mat, then you know what it means. Right? So you'd be home. So that's how you characterize the meanings of all the sentences of the language by this kind of um, axiomatic approach. That's Davidson's general project for giving a theory of meaning for a language. Okay. As I said last time, during the 1970s and 1980s, the whole generation of philosophers of language devoted the best years of their lives to doing this I mean, including Davidson for individual bits of English. I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I mean, it's, it's still very popular. I mean, it's still the, the default, right? That's still how most people think I think the meanings of the signs of a language should be characterized. Okay. So the notion of reference, what you're using the notion of reference for in this kind of account is for getting these kind of axioms that let you generate these SP pairings. Yeah, the, that's what talk about reference does. It lets you generate these SP pairings for your language. And this is where Davidson's instrumentalism comes in. Um, <coughs> Davidson's idea was we've got to give up the concept of reference as basic to an empirical theory of language. These notions like the reference, these notions, he means notions like the reference of a name or what it takes for a sign to apply to an object. These notions we must treat as theoretical constructs whose function is exhausted in stating the truth conditions for sentences. So what you need is you need some finite axioms up here. And then you're going to um, use them to generate all your SP pairings. Um, but that's the only point of talk about reference. Its only role is to let you derive those SP pairings. And once they've done that, their job is done. They are just gas. They are just convenient theoreticians' devices, just um, gadgets to let you crank out the SP pairings. The function is exhausted in stating the truth conditions for sentences. So when Frege and Russell and 
Kripke and Searle and so on were talking about, well, what does it take for the name to be hooked up to the object? That was a bad question. That's treating reference as if it's got a life of its own outside the context of these axioms. But the only point of the notion of reference is to let you generate these SP pairings. Once it's done that, its work is done, and there is nothing more to be said about what reference is really. <laughs> OK. So the meaning theory doesn't give any empirical content directly to relations between names or predicates and objects. That's just a big mistake in the theory of meaning to, to look for that. These relations between names or predicates and bits of the world, the, they are only given a content indirectly. When these sentences, these SP pairings, they mean something. I mean, they, are, they have empirical significance. The, 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 they have some uh, friction in what, uh, I mean, suppose you're taking a theory for the signs of French that is telling you what all the words refer to and so on. The only way you test that theory is by saying, does it get the truth conditions of the French sentences right? There's no question, what's, what do the words really refer to? The empirical constraints in when a theory of meaning is correct are the constraints on when a pairing S is true if and only if P is correct. And what it takes for this to be true is that P should be a translation of the sentence that S names. Right? That's where we began. Um, and these are so the empirical constraints are, have I got it right what the translation in the meta language is of this sentence S of the object language? These are constraints in translation that operate at the level of whole sentences. And the basic constraint, empirical constraint, on meaning, Davison says, is charity. You interpret the other as holding true sentences that you also hold true. So if um, you're standing uh, beside the indigenous speaker of the language and a rabbit bolts across the horizon and the native speaker says, Gavagai, then since in that context you would think it's right to say that's a rabbit, you take it that the um, indigenous speaker is saying something that you can translate as that's a rabbit. You don't suppose that the native speaker is saying, um, look, here's my Aunt Cecilia, if you see what I mean, when it's plainly not your Aunt Cecilia or his Aunt Cecilia or her, her Aunt Cecilia. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't do that very well. Um, <laughs> if, if, the, if you're interpreting speakers of a foreign language, you try to interpret them so that what they say comes out true by and large. So that when you say uh, their sentence is true just in this case, then if they think it's true, it should be something that you think is true. If it's something that you think is manifestly false, you shouldn't, ascribe, you shouldn't interpret them in such a way that they come out holding it true. Do you see what I mean? You assume that the people you're trying to translate are kind of reasonable. That's incompetent. That's charity. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's very good. There's a lot of um, mileage uh, uh, for, for that example in this context. Yeah. But notice that in that context, um, what Marco Polo is trying to do is to interpret the native speakers as uh, saying things that are right. He's saying, what's it called? And they're saying, it's called Madagascar. That one's Madagascar. And he's assuming that they are not making some stupid mistake. right? And, and pointing to something else. He's assuming that they're right. Yeah. Um, and so, so Marco Polo is actually trying to conform to this um, maxim. Yeah. Um, and the fact that he hasn't succeeded in conforming to the maxim will come out when you consider the other remarks the native speakers make. 
Marco Polo obviously did not do his homework on this, but the, the other native speakers would presumably have said things like um, Madagascar, I mean, only they'd have done this in Swahili or wh whatever, but they, they'd have said things like um, Madagascar is not an island. Madagascar is part of the mainland. Yeah, Madagascar you can get to without using a boat. Uh, you, you see what I mean? That, so that if he was going to interpret all the sentences they hold true of Madagascar, um, he, wouldn't have been, he wouldn't have wanted to interpret them as referring to the island, but making a bunch of stupid mistakes. Yeah, namely thinking he was part of the mainland and so on. He would have said, oh, I've got to revise this idea that when they say Madagascar, they're referring to the island because that makes them come out false. You, yeah, you see what I mean? Yeah. Okay, so in translating, you just do try to um, meet this constraint, but uh, that constraint applies only at the level of whole sentences. You're trying to get the sentences that the other speaker makes to come out true. So on this view, if you've got two theories that are giving you the same SP pairings, so you've got the same uh, SP pairings being cranked out, but maybe different sets of gadgets up in the axioms, yeah, then there's no difference between the two theories. If one's true, the other's true. Um, so for example, look, so to take this little theory again with Raleigh and Isaac and fishes and smokes. Right? Here's a different theory you could give for the same language. Suppose you say Raleigh doesn't refer to Raleigh. Raleigh refers to something quite different. Ra the name Raleigh refers to the place that's one mile west of Raleigh. Okay? That's a different axiom. And the name Isaac refers to the place this one mile west of Isaac. And I give the following um, uh, axioms for the predicates of this little language. I say the predicate smokes applies to something just in case the person one mile east of that thing smokes. And the predicate fishes applies to something just in case the predicate one mile east of that thing fishes. Okay, so these are different, pre different axioms for Raleigh and Isaac and smokes and fishes, right? Is there any difference between this theory and the other theory? Well, they both give you the same result. Suppose you ask, what does it take for Raleigh smokes to be true on this theory? Well, what does Raleigh refer to? Raleigh refers to the place one mile west of Raleigh. Well, smokes applies to something, if and only if the person one mile east of that thing smokes. So um, we want to know what, what it takes for Raleigh smokes to be true. Well, it'll be true just in case the predicate applies to what this refers to. What this refers to is that place. And the predicate applies to that place just if the person one mile east of that place smokes. So who is it? There is one mile east of that place. It is none other than Raleigh. Because the place was the place one mile west of Raleigh. So if you go to the place that is one mile west of Raleigh and ask, who is it that is one mile east of that place? It is none other than Raleigh, right? So um, the predicate is going to apply to that place just in case Raleigh smokes. So Raleigh smokes will be true by this theory if and only if Raleigh smokes. So the axiom, and, and should, <laughs> should I do that again? Um, you, you want me to do that for something like Isaac Fishes? You, take, you, you, you see how it's going to go for Isaac Fishes. Isaac's referring to this place one mile uh, west of Isaac. Um, and the predicate's going to apply to that place just in case the thing one mile east of it fishes. So you get shunted back to good old Isaac to see whether that's Isaac fishes to find out whether the predicate applies to that place. Right. So Isaac fishes will be true if and only if Isaac fishes. So this theory has got different axioms 
to the first theory. But the same SP pairings get cranked out. Yeah? So is there any difference between these two theories? Davison saying it, no, there is no difference between these theories. I mean, it's like, if you, if you go back to the Ptolemaic system of epicycles for predicting what you're going to see in the night sky, these are very complicated theories. You could have two different theories stated in terms of different sets of epicycles as cranking out predictions as to what you're going to see in the night sky. But these theories are just convenient fictions generating predictions as to what you're going to see. So there's no real dispute between two different predictive theories using different sets of epicycles, but predicting the same macroscopic observations in the night sky. Yeah. The theories are only just ways of pre generating these predictions. But if that's right, if Davison's right about this, then there is no fact of the matter about whether the name that should have inverted commas around it, whether the name Raleigh refers to the person Raleigh or the place one mile west of Raleigh. And if it works for Raleigh and the place one mile west of Raleigh, well, it, you, that, that, it wasn't all that clever a trick to do this for Raleigh and the place one mile west of Raleigh. If they can do it like this, there are obviously going to be endlessly many different ways I could, I could keep getting that effect, generating theories that are just variants of one another. So there's no saying what the name Raleigh really refers to. It doesn't really refer to anything. It only makes sense to talk about reference in the context of some or another arbitrary theory that cranks out the right SP pairings one way or another. But the question, what is the name Raleigh really refer to makes no sense. It's like saying which system of epicycles is the right system of epicycles. If they're all just bits of gas for cranking out the predictions, there's no saying which one's right. None of them is right. Um, reference is indeterminate. As Quine put it, inscrutable. Um, there is no saying what the sort of sign of a language really refers to. That's one way of getting at what in this view is so wrong with um, the Frege, Russell, Kripke, Gritschke, Fodor approach. OK? OK. I don't myself really see how this can be right. Um, I think it's very powerfully put, but I think it's difficult to see how it can be right. Because th this is where I want to raise the question that was raised earlier. Why is it so important to get finite axioms? Why is it so important to do this? I mean, as I said, through the 70s and 80s and still today, people attach great importance to constructing this kind of theory. But why do they care about showing how the meaning of a sentence depends on the meanings of its parts? If it's just a matter of getting some gadgets in there that will, some gas that will one way or another generate the right SP pairings. Why bother? Well, why go for finiteness? Why not just say? Um, you could just state this generally. S is true if and only if P, or what replaces P is always a translation of the sentence S. Leave it at that. Why do all this hard work of trying to figure out how the meaning of a sentence depends on the meanings of the words? I mean, we could explain what translate means by talking about the empirical constraints in translation, like charity. Well, I think it's kind of obvious why people don't do that. The, the natural idea is that people, ordinary speakers, don't learn a language one sentence at a time. That's what you do when you're using a phrase book in a foreign country. You might just Real, you know, I, I don't have any idea what any of the words means, but I know that this sentence means the same as the English sentence, help get me out of here. So you read the whole thing, right? Um, can you lend me a dollar? But, you, know, you know, convenient <laughs> sentences like that you learn, right? But ordinarily, when you're understanding your own language, you don't do it sentence by sentence, you do it word by word. 
you have a vocabulary. There's a finite string of words that you've learned, and you can understand those words in the context of any sentence where you understand all the other words. You see what I mean? You, you, the way to describe someone's linguistic repertoire is not the way, the, the way to characterize the extent and the limitations of their understanding of a language is not to give a big list of all the sentences they can do. It's to list all the words that they understand. When you're learning a language, you do it by learning words, not by some phrase book method. Right? When you, uh, that's why dictionaries are helpful. Right? Um, and when you lose your grasp of a language, which <laughs> doubtless has not happened to you guys yet, but I promise you happens. Um, when you're losing your understanding of a language, what happens is that you forget the meanings of the words you used to know. I used to know what um, monomers were. I used to know what the Haber process was. Um, yeah, there are all these things that you used to know, but now you don't understand sentences containing those words anymore. Yeah? So when you're losing your grasp of a language, you lose your grasp of a language word by word, not sentence by sentence. You lose your grasp of all the sentences containing an individual word when you lose your grasp of that word. So when we're characterizing an ordinary speaker's understanding of a language, we can't characterize it by SP pairs. We have to characterize the, the way an ordinary speaker understands a language by something to do with their grasp of individual words. And then you ask, now, how does it, how is it that you understand the word Raleigh? And there has to be some empirical content to that. It's not just gas. Something is going on in your brain that relates to the individual word. And you ask, well, what is it? that you uh, do when you learn the meaning of the word Raleigh? Well, the meaning of the word Raleigh, y y you understand words like that by something like being introduced to the object. Someone says, lo, Raleigh. Here's Justin. Right? <laughs> something like that. I mean, that wouldn't help you with Raleigh, but it, it would help you with the name Justin. Right? Um, uh, and you learn the name by being introduced to that object. You would not be taught the meaning of the name Raleigh by being shown, look, here's this place one mile west of Raleigh. Right? That's not the way it works. If you, if you said, um, uh, I, I don't know who Justin is, can you tell me, who, if, you, if you don't mind me using you as an example, um, can you tell me who Justin is? Um, I could say, well, there's this place, right? And the predicates applying um, here are, are, are true if and only if the person um, uh, 15 yards um, north of that place uh, fish and smoke and so on. Uh, yeah? That wouldn't help at all, just me pointing to the place. What you really want to get is an encounter with a person. That's what will tell you who Justin is. When we're explaining the name, Davidson writes as if these would do equally well, right? There's no factor the matter which one is right. So either would be just fine. But actually, there is some empirical difference between learning the word Raleigh by being introduced to Raleigh and learning the word Raleigh by being introduced to a place or one mile west of Raleigh. We have to try and catch that. There has to be something about your understanding of a language that doesn't operate just at the level of sentences but does operate at the level of words, something we can say about your grasp of individual words. And in the face of it, what you'd have to do here is look at the role of perception in your understanding of individual words. In a lot of these examples, um, what's going on is you say, uh, look, how do you learn the color words? You don't just learn whole sentences. You learn the word red by being shown lots of examples. Perception is keyed to the predicate. This is red, that's red, that's red, and so on. Uh, this is blue, this is blue, this is blue, and, and, and so on. Um, uh, 
there's something about perception is um, what's anchoring in the end your understanding of individual words. And Davison's theory that only applies, that only talks about the empirical constraints and these SP pairings is not catching the way perception works in our understanding of individual terms of the language. Okay, this is where pollution kicks in. This is where pollution takes off, takes up, and uh, we'll look at that next time. Okay, thanks for showing out on this exciting day. Okay.